So uh, this actually, this panel um, is part of a larger session that happened before the Ask Me Anything session. It actually ranked really high in audience participation, audience feedback, and so we had to bring it back as a keynote at Affiliate Summit East. So real quick, um, before I introduce the panelists and our experts, start thinking about what SEO questions you may want to ask them, because this is going to become an engaging conversation and an open forum for you to be able to ask these experts anything you'd like in search engine optimization. So let me start with Bruce Clay, all the way over here to your right. Um, Bruce, Bruce Clay is a founder and president of Bruce Clay Inc., a global internet marketing optimization firm. As an industry thought leader, he's an accomplished speaker, author, and educator. He hosts a weekly podcast called SEM Synergy, and his book, Search Engine Optimization, All-in-One for Dummies, is now in its third edition. Next up, Dwayne Forster. He is the vice president of organic search operations at Bruce Clay. Now, prior to this role, Dwayne was a senior product manager with Bing's Webmaster program and the in-house SEM running the SEO program for MSN in the US and all the Americas in his earlier Microsoft career. He's also the author of two books, How to Make Money with Your Blog and Turn Clicks into Customers. He's written for publications ranging from Search Engine Land and Entrepreneur Magazine to the New York Times and Inc. He's even spent time advising the staff who maintained the White House's website. That's pretty uh, cool. Yeah, whitehouse.gov. Whitehouse.gov. <laughs> Covering uh -huh. that. Is there a difference? I didn't even know they had a Big website. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last uh, but not least is Stefan Spencer. Um, he is internationally recognized SEO expert and best-selling author of Google Power Search, co-author of Social E-Commerce, and co-author of The Art of SEO, which is now in its third edition and considered the Bible of SEO. Stefan's clients he's consulted for have included Zappos, Sony Store, Quicksilver, Best Buy Canada, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Chanel. Stefan speaks at many internet marketing events, like this one. Uh, he's contributed to Huffington Post, Search Engine Land, DM News, among others. He also hosts two podcasts, The Optimized Geek and Marketing Speak. So again, um, please, let's have your undivided attention. Put those phones away unless you're tweeting. Hashtag SES, S, uh, sorry, ASE16. And um, Bruce, do you want to start us off? Sure. All right. Good morning. I'm glad you're all here. How many are awake? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's a good start. Uh, as was mentioned, we've done this uh, a number of times. Uh, we have a couple of interesting things that come out of this. We can start it with a question of our own. We have plenty of questions that we get all the time. Uh, we have given this panel a number of times. The uh, specific rule we have on questions is that when you ask a question, we ask that they be general questions for the audience. If you have a specific question, that's at the end of the session, come up and see us, because we're still going to be here for about an hour after the session answering questions. Uh, it always works that way. Um, I have a, a couple of uh, comments in general, just so you all know it. Uh, we are all white hat people. Uh, we do not cheat the system, and we will never advise you to. Uh, Google uh, has penalties for that. Um, the uh, comments that we make during the session have historically been tweeted a lot, so remember ASC 16. Uh, we encourage you to do that. Uh, everybody should have received an evaluation form when you came in. Uh, you can save time, just circle 10. It saves a lot of time later. That way, when you, you, know, when you leave, you can just pass it out. It, it won't be a problem. Uh, I want to encourage you to do that because it really helps. We, I don't we, know who it helps, but it really helps. We promise was not. that white hat, though? Yeah, it was, was white hat. It totally okay. was. Totally because we've, we've marked that with an ad. Right. Um, we, we, promise <laughs> not to, uh, we promise not to suck as well. OK, so uh, we have a couple comments about ourselves so that you can understand where we're at. Um, and we're going to sort of introduce ourselves, and I'll start us with a question. Uh, we have two people that are in the audience with wireless mics. One, two. So what will happen is I'll probably go from side to side. Uh, when you have a question, you know, raise your hand. I point to you, you stand up. That way the guy with the mic knows who you are. And then we'll come over, take the question, and we'll just go through as many as we can. Uh, obviously there's a lot more people 
here than we have time for if everybody had a question. Um, Bruce Clay, Inc., we started in January of 1996. Uh, for those of you that remember, that was uh, three years before Google. Uh, that's back when Al Gore invented the internet. So it was quite a while is, back. Is anyone here born after that date? Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, We're good. They, they'd We're be good. like 18. Yeah, it changed, but what happens is we have to answer questions then with emojis, emojis only. And so that makes it a whole lot harder for us. Yes. The, uh, so we've been in the ink 5,009 times. So uh, we have uh, done well. We're on five continents. So we cover international as well as domestic. I'll, um, I'm not going to walk you guys through my background. Um, I have a background, however, in gambling. That's kind of where I got my online start. Prior to that, it was at Caesars Palace, you know, legit gambling. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways from this, and this is why this is popular with us, a number of years ago when I was at Bing inside Microsoft, I ran a roadshow tour with Inc. Magazine as our partner, and we went from city to city around the U.S., and we invited small businesses to come in and ask us their pressing questions. Um, myself and Bruce were part of that panel, as well as a couple of other folks. Um, it was a hugely successful event, and it gave us an amazing amount of uh, exposure to small businesses, their concerns. Um, the problems that they faced, and we managed to help a lot of folks overcome those, get past that initial hurdle and move forward. Uh, I think the really cool thing about it was that, you know, we, we talk about this as SEO and, you know, Sean, God bless him, he's an awesome guy, you know, he calls this SEO. Uh, what you will probably notice throughout this is we can field pretty much any question. Um, we, we've, we've got it covered in terms of topics. Um, so if you have something that's beyond SEO, feel free to give it a try. And a lot of times you'll have us just saying, you know, you need to consult a lawyer for that because there are times when you actually need legal advice on things and we'll point you in the right direction. Um, other times though, uh, we may just huddle behind the table here. Um, we're just agreeing on an answer. We're not cowering in fear. Speak well, yeah. for yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I've uh, been in this space for even longer than Bruce. I started Net oh. Concepts in 1995. <laughs> Built my first website in 94. I started in 1972. <laughs> so okay, I, well, as a person. So Sorry. I predate Al Gore. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my big claim to fame, though, is uh, this book. I have a couple others, but this is a pretty good book. It's a thousand pages. And I brought a few with me to hand out. So who wants a book? Like, who really wants a book? Like, yeah! like, like enough to come get a book. Like, seriously, who wants to come get a book? Seriously, you're going to walk? <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah, that's it. I mean, somebody's got to get it. So early bird gets the worm. T-L-D-R. Too long, didn't read. <laughs> oh, that was a joke. Okay. Anywho, I've got some more to give out. So if you have a really great tweet, you might get a book. If you have a really great question, you might get a book. Give me 50 bucks, you might get a book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to basically start with one of our questions. Um, now, I'll, I'll start with a comment. If you think you are able to learn SEO in a couple of hours, uh, you're probably wrong. There's two levels to SEO, uh, basically uh, things that you do and things that you actually plan for and work at. And, and just like affiliate, you have to work at it. You have to learn it. You have to practice it. You have to evolve it. You got to get better over time. So uh, all of those things we are able to help you with. Um, as I said, if you have a specific question, we'll help you with it. Just come up at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, the question I'm going to start with is, um, what do you think is happening in search over the next six months to a year? And how does it affect this audience? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, when I was at Microsoft, I spent a lot of time in the engineering groups of, uh, of Bing and got to know the teams, got to know the projects, and it was always exciting stuff. Um, I, 
I will preface this by saying that I still am under NDA from the company, so obviously there are some things I won't share with you, but I will say this. Uh, the areas of voice search and gesture search are um, currently one of the leading areas that uh, everyone is investing in for various uh, and very real reasons. Is anyone here using WhatsApp? Anything like it? Raise your hands, keep them up for me. Okay, so maybe a quarter of the crowd. Um, you know, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, a lot of folks have a, a kind of love-hate relationship with WhatsApp. They don't fully understand it or don't see a value for it and whatnot. But the fact of the matter is uh, these messaging services are probably going to be one of the richest grounds moving forward. It's something that everyone wants to do is just communicate. Um, raise your hand if you have this in your life. Uh, largely virtual relationships with people. <laughs> Email, Twitter, Facebook, all of that. So the rest of you are just lazy or your arm is hung over from last night. That's fine. Um, everybody has this in their lives. And these services, this is why you see Google and Microsoft and Facebook investing in artificial intelligence in these services. Might sound, it might not seem intuitive at first, but those services are areas where we need to understand the emotional content and the emotional context to better surface information that's relevant to the conversation. And so anything to do with voice. And by extension, because voice is tied to a mobile device, now we get into gesture. These types of activities are going to have a big influence on search. You know, at first, over the next six to 12 months, you'll see them. The voice stuff is already here. Can you define uh, gestures, though? I can. So uh, in, a, in the most nascent of cases, you will be using your hands to simply execute on your device as you can now. The camera is there. Uh, you may think it's not watching, but it is actually watching. You may think your microphone is turned off, but it's actually listening. Does anyone have an Amazon Echo? Right? It's a pretty cool piece of technology. Um, here's what's really cool about it. It's always on, unless you physically unplug it. It's always on and listening. So there are plenty of instances where people have used Echo, had it turned on, just sitting on the kitchen counter, had a conversation with their spouse, later that night been surfing online, and ads related to what they were talking about in their conversation now start showing up in their internet session. And people think of that as, oh, that's coincidental. There's nothing coincidental about it at all. <laughs> that information is being gathered, shared anonymously, and then fed into systems that will then track you. And, the idea being, if you were interested in it three hours ago, you may still be interested in it right now. So gesture now becomes another layer to this. Um, I had, uh, for a while, I had a Kinect on my Xbox. And that thing was awesome because I could walk into the room and make a series of hand gestures to get it to turn on, power up search, and then I could tell it to order a pizza and it would dial out over VoIP, connect me with my local pizzeria. I could speak to the person out loud while I was letting my dogs outside and by the time the dogs came back inside, the pizza was on its way to my house. So all of our technologies, all of this exists right now. And as mobile is already entrenched and continues to become a bigger slice of the pie, one of the biggest telling factors is now more than ever, people are keeping their devices for a longer period of time. The average swap time for a smartphone in the United States right now is a little over two years, uh, provided, of course, you don't crush it. It's a little over two years for people to, to swap their phones, which means they're getting deeper into the technology. They have more exposure to it. They're managing settings at a deeper level. And as that generation of millennials and the beginnings of Gen Z come into purchasing power and they start impacting these areas, it guides search. That's where WhatsApp and all of these messaging areas and the AI behind it starts to play a role. So that's, that's my guess. That's my, my take on it. All right. For me, I'd say uh, rank brain and machine learning are going to be uh, either your biggest friend or your biggest enemy. So a year, like last year when uh, rank brain was announced, it was announced that it was running across 15% of all searches on, on Google. Now they have announced this year that it's on 100%. And I predicted back last year that it was going to ratchet up to 100% very quickly. So I, I knew it was coming, and Google says there are three main things they pay attention to in their, their rankings algorithm. They have three things they base rankings on. Relevance, links, and rank brain. Thanks for the, that was, that was awesome. Yeah, I got your back, man. <laughs> what was, um, uh, who's the lady on, what was it, um, Wheel of Fortune? Vanna White. Vanna White, you're my Vanna. Thank there you. There you go. 
So oh. rank brain is going to be really important for you to understand and get behind because if you have AI essentially dis determining whether you're creating quality content and whether it's relevant and whether it is authoritative instead of just link building, which still is the primary signal. I mean, if you're not actively link building, you're just leaving it to chance and that's not a good strategy, but not the kind of low quality link building that oftentimes you get sold when you get a phone call, right? One of these uh, robo dialers. Now this has to be essentially content marketing, creating really high quality content that deserves to be shared, linked to, blogged about, and then you promote it in a way that is uh, not spammy. So having relationships with power users, influencers, and helping them giving before you're getting, before you're getting. So give, then get. Not go out and outreach to all these influencers and say, hey, I've got this great piece of content, can you link to it? That's a, that's a get, not a give. So that's one thing, is rank brain and creating stuff that is going to stand the test of time, that will pass the sniff test by an algorithm that you will not be able to reverse engineer, and neither can even the Google engineers who've created it. And, and the other thing that I want you to bear in mind is the advent of personal sims, which we're already seeing, uh, you know, kind of uh, this idea that your sim is going to know more about you than your spouse or your significant other. Kind of scary, but it's well on its way. So think about this. You're, we are already subjected to uh, this kind of uh, filter effect. We are only getting the news and the buzzworthy content on social media that we know, that the algorithms know is going to appeal to us. So we're in a filter bubble. And it's only going to get worse as these personal sims take over more and more of our lives. And that's going to increase exponentially. So over the next year, we're going to see that really uh, ratchet up. But over the next few years, we are going to be so reliant on our personal sim. It's like, imagine somebody taking your phone away uh, from you for a day or, you know, heaven forbid, a week. Imagine being without your personal sim is going to be 10 times worse than that. It's just going to be your life, and you're going to rely on it for everything from uh, you know, letting you know if there's a really important email in your inbox that you need to deal with immediately, or um, you know, give you a heads up on, on current uh, events, or um, book your travel. Anything that you would imagine that you give nowadays to your virtual assistant, you can give it to your personal sim in the next few years. I think that uh, it would make sense to uh, take this as to what does it mean for each of you. The basics of this is that every single person doing a search is going to be personalized whether they want to be or not. That it's going to know where you're at, it's going to know what you prefer, it's going to know what you mean. It's going to look at what you have done before. It'll look at exactly the way the phrases and the keywords are worded. And each individual, if everybody in this room did a search at the same time, you may end up with different search results. And that is what's going to happen to your clients. The people trying to find your website by SEO are going to have exactly that experience. How many people here do voice search at all? Okay, imagine if it were everybody. When you do voice search, you ask questions. The system tries to figure out what you meant by the question, and each of you may ask the same thing differently, and everyone will get a different set of top 10. When we are talking about SEO, what we're describing is a future where SEO has, from the standpoint of the search engines, become a lot more than just activity. It isn't a list of SEO things you do. It is a list of uh, 
processes and thinking and activity and analysis that allows you to differentiate yourself from everybody around you. The entire affiliate market is focused on being least imperfect. Look at what other people are doing and do it better. When we talk about SEO, that is exactly what we're talking about. Now, I don't think we want to have a doom and gloom future here, but understand when you do a search, you're going to get customized, personalized results. When your customer does a search, they're going to get the same. And what you're going to want to do is figure out how to get your websites in that list. And that's going to be one of the hardest things uh, to be done. Now, there's lots of stuff that you do. Uh, certainly, I mean, we can't say title tags are unimportant. We can't say, you know, you can't do content. We can't say, you know, you, you're going to win if you have more links than everybody else. What we know is the search engines are starting to figure out all those things. They're starting to figure out that if people mention you without linking to you, that you still get a boost for that even though there's no physical link there. Mentions are going to count more and more and more in the future. It's an issue of credibility. Uh, you, by the way, you definitely want to get people to start mentioning you even if they don't link to you. That's going to be vital uh, going forward. But all these things are part of what SEO is, will become, and how to do it. Now what I want to do is start with some questions. I'm assuming somebody has one. Uh, and we'll start like on this side of the room. So does anybody have a question? Stand up, please. Mike is coming. Off the topic of the mentions, um, have we seen evidence of uh, negative connotations to the search results? So if someone mentions you negatively, does it affect you versus someone oh, mentions yeah. someone positively? You want to talk about negative SEO? You want to take us down a dark alley? No, 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 no. Well, I mean, <laughs> instead of like, for example, you know, obviously Google built this core algorithm off the linking and reference on that. And now we're moving more into a generation where we can, as you said, more socially, where we can mention you without linking directly to you. But have we seen evidence that with that? Because, I mean, when you start talking about algorithm and changing from where it's just a link, a link's easy to recognize, filter out, and build that, around that. And we've done that for 20, 30 years now. You know, but if you turn around and start talking about uh, you know, filtering text and content namings and references of companies, you at that point in time, once you achieve that ability to take a three name, you know, three letters and put it, you know, three words and put them together and recognize it to be a link to a reference of a company, you've reached that point in time that you can quickly distinctly start to parse the context and tone of the content that's being posted about mm. that individual or Google has been working on sentiment for a long time. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, a, a famous case here in New York uh, about a sunglass company uh, where they would intentionally send out broken sunglasses to people and then when the people would complain, they'd tell them to complain about it on a website and be sure to link to their website. And the rankings actually went up the more complaints they had. Um, don't do that. Don't do that. He's serving three Just, years right now. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> fundamentally, the Google response at the time was, we don't sort on sentiment. This was their response at the time. We don't sort on sentiment because if we did, none of the political websites would rank. <laughs> we all know how that works, right? <laughs> so, but they claim that they are working it. So I would imagine that uh, uh, mentions and links uh, certainly will be impacted by it. Uh, one of the things about links is it used to be the case where everybody felt that whoever died with the most links wins, right? All you, all you need to do is keep getting links. Well, it turns out that now Google uh, can penalize you if you have links from the wrong type of sites, bad sites for sure. But if the site is what's called inorganic, it has nothing to do with your content, there's a high probability that it's going to be ignored in the future. That you will actually have links that you have that are of zero value because you got the link from somewhere that has no knowledge and is certainly not expert in your field, therefore the link is just a link as opposed to a testimonial from an expert. So. Uh, we have to be careful not just of sentiment, we have to be careful of whether it is appropriate site linking to you, uh, and that, that's going to overwhelm everything. If it's a legitimate site, right? If it's an illegitimate site, a spam site that's linking to you, then you can get dinged for it, and that's been something that has been going on for a while now. 
Uh, so cleaning up your toxic links, first of all, identifying them using something like Link Detox, which is from Link Research Tools, or um, you know, some like there are other tools that do that. But basically, you're triaging your links, looking for what's toxic, what's suspicious, and what's innocuous. And the suspicious ones you have to go through by hand, decide if they're toxic or not. And then the toxic ones you have to go and clean up. And you can't just add them to a disavow file, submit that to Google, and be done. You have to show some effort. Google needs to see that you put the work in before they let you out of the penalty box. So you can get a manual penalty, a manual action is what it's called, and you can check inside of Google Search Console to see if that's the case. Or you could get an algorithmic penalty. So the algorithm of Penguin, probably you've all heard of, is a thing that is link related that you could get dinged by if you have a lot of unnatural links or uh, low quality links. So you need to clean that up. And uh, you have to reach out to all these webmasters and ask them to remove the link. It's a big pain in the butt. So you'd use a tool to help you do that, kind of semi-automate that process, like Pitchbox, for example. Um, and you would chase after them, send them several emails, kind of escalate and say, well, I really don't want to submit you in my disavow file because that's probably not going to be good for your website and I'd like to avoid that, so can you please remove my link? You know, so you kind of escalate the tone after a certain period of time if they don't respond. And you might have to follow up two or three times. And if a single digit percentage of the people who have linked to you with toxic links remove their links, that's good enough. Um, as long as you put in enough effort that Google says, yep, that looks like you've tried. They're not expecting you to get 30% of those links removed. So that's a big pain in the butt and it has to be done. It's been a long time since Penguin's been updated. So if um, you were unfortunate enough to have gotten dinged for this in the past, you might have been waiting several years to get out of the penalty box, even though you've done the cleanup. If you find yourself needing to do something called link pruning, that's the process of actually going through and removing it. Uh, we have blog posts on our site uh, that actually give you a step-by-step -step process for how to start with the link removal. It's called link pruning. And right down through how to fill out disavow files and submit them to Google. So that whole process has been documented and is available free. Just go to the website and pick it up. So I'm going to take one step back before several steps forward here. Um, does anyone know what the main currency of a search engine actually is? Any guesses? Ads. Mm, that's not the currency I'm thinking of. The currency is reputation. That's ultimately what it is. And the reputation is built on every single search result that comes back. Think about it when you do a, when you do a query on a search engine and the search engine gets it for you the first time. It doesn't even register in your head. You just move forward. You got what you wanted. That was your expectation. You clicked on the link. You found your information. You move forward. But think about every one of those times when the result that came back that was at the top of the stack wasn't what you wanted. An instance where you clicked on it, went in, nope, went back, clicked on the second one. Incidentally, that's called dwell time, and it counts against you when it's very short. So the engine is being very careful to measure quality for the end user, for the searcher. So now we take a couple of steps forward. Sentiment matters. For years, the engines have understood sentiment. For years, the engines have understood the difference between fat and fat, F-A-T and P-H-A-T. They understand this because it is very, excuse me, it is very simple to program the system with the meaning of words. The context comes from the volumes that we're dealing with here. I'll give you a concept of the volumes. And what I'm about to tell you is actually a very small percentage. When I started at MSN and I took over that program, we had 168 channels worldwide. Not a big number. The Autos channel in the United States alone, the autos.msn.com subdomain, was comprised of over 10 million active pages. That's the scale of an operation like MSN. The scale of the internet is exponentially larger, and the engines have the ability to see it in near real time 
and see all of the activities that are happening on it. So, has anyone seen the movie Office Space? Right, everybody loves that, right? Everybody gets the concept behind it, right? Rounding way after the decimal, little bit of a penny here and there, that's sentiment on the internet. Those are the mentions, the unlinked mentions. They build up, they accrue value, and they impact you. They go toward your reputation. So, negative SEO. You talk to Google, Google will tell you, and Bing will tell you, it doesn't exist. Mm. I will tell you, bullshit. Here's why. I have a client we're working with right now. Does anyone here own a .xyz domain name? Please, no one raise your hand, because <laughs> I will walk through the audience and stab you with my pen. So. Wow, that's a little violent. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. I understand that, right? I am a domainer, and there are certain things that get my hackles up. So if you look back uh, several months, what you will notice is that about 3.2 million brand new .xyz domains came into existence live on the internet. Not a big deal because at any given time there are approximately 8 trillion URLs on the internet, so relatively small percentage of the overall. However, they're being used by groups and what they are doing is targeting random businesses. So each one of these domains has a WordPress installation. Each one of these domains has four or five links at it. So let's say it's five links. Four of those are pointed at another .xyz domain, and one of them is pointed at a legitimate website. Now, that kind of almost instant-on linking that shows up has a very detrimental effect. The algorithm, basic mathematics, looks at that and says, not a pattern that we like, it's non-organic, we should like really assess this for quality. So what we've noticed, one of our clients has seen as soon as that ramped up, their ranking started to slide. And when you talk to Google, the first thing they tell you is, oh no, we're well aware of that XYZ. We do a really good job of filtering for that. Well, I might counter that with actual data that shows completely legitimate websites sliding in their ranking and lower quality competitors starting to move up which is actually one of the biggest challenges with rank brain. So if you've, if you've done any research on AI, you know that there are multiple stages for artificial intelligence. Um, and the last stage is the end of humanity. That's, that's the end stage for AI. That was a joke. Okay, this doesn't work, that if I have to, yeah, it, it doesn't work <laughs> if I have to explain it, right? So, um, but the, the early stages of AI are much like training a toddler that there's very little experience to pull on, even if they are very smart technically. And so if you've noticed over the last year or so, there's been a quality degradation in the results in Google in a lot of areas. And that's because all of the brain power is being applied to very specific areas across the internet that matter, things like entertainment and news and things like this. And that has allowed problems to crop up in other areas that Google now has to go back and figure out. The difficulty being, if they're not entirely sure what's happening inside the black box, then how do you fix it? So if we want to talk about sentiment, it matters. If we want to talk about negative, it matters, which is why you cannot afford to ignore these things. And you have to be aware of these things. You know, there used to be a time where we could all sit back and say, I'm not worried about my links, you know, because that's other people pointing at me. And I trust the engines to figure it out. And that was largely the case. Today, unfortunately, we're in a bit of a pothole on this superhighway, and, and we need to be more aware and take more action on those things ourselves. Yeah, as long as you have a competitor, and you do, because anybody who is competing against yes. you in the search results wanting to outrank you is a competitor, you need to be concerned about negative SEO. You need to run a link detox check and make sure that you don't have too many toxic links, because the stuff sneaks up on you. Some dodgy competitor decides to take you down, buys a bunch of links for you for 99 bucks from uh, overseas, and then your rankings tank. And I, I want to expand on this slightly. Um, there, there's a, yes, there's a, <laughs> there's a lack of fairness that exists in search, and it's always going to be that way. Um, again, the currency is reputation and trust, so the engines would prefer to be able to put somebody at the top of the stack that they know is completely trustworthy at all times which is why in major queries, large head type queries, you see a lot of brands occupying that space. Those brands are just as much a target for anything negative as anybody else is. The difficulty for anyone negative trying to hit them is that they are so established and they are so large and they have so much trust 
that you can't necessarily dislodge that. It takes exponentially more effort to do that. When you're a smaller or a mid-sized business, it takes summarily less effort to impact you. So you're smaller, you're trying to grow, that can be a challenge, and that's one of the reasons why. Quick survey, so, how many people here believe Google is in the business of making money? Mm -hmm. That should be all of you, right? Mm -hmm. How much money do they make on organic results? I don't want to field a guess. Mm -hmm. None. Zero dollars. So are they motivated as a business to help us rank organically? The only advantage they have is that the organic results keep people going back and doing searches. So they're going to pick the highest expert, the highest authority, and the highest trust sites. Those are what are going to show up. What we need to do is establish a content and a, and a networking capability for mentions and links that are high reputation to establish ourselves as an expert. That is more important than saying, I have to edit my title tag. Uh, do you need the title tag to be right? Of course. Those are activities. But you really want the outcome to come and, and work. I think we need another question from this side somewhere. Well, we have one over here. Yeah, we have a question. Yeah. Well, we have by, a, by the way, the previous question on, on uh, sentiment, uh, you can, up. at the end, come up and I'll give you a book. Uh, this isn't my question, but just, Bruce, <laughs> to, your, to your point there, but don't you think the staying on the engine is them making money? I mean, like when I think about the universal plays they've done with, like, medical information or movie times or all those kinds of things, they're keeping people on there for a reason, not just for kicks. If you keep me on longer, will I click an ad? I don't, I don't know. I, to me, there is a money play in there. It's just indirect. Um, I'm a graduate of Bruce Clay back in like 2005. So just thought I would let you know that I came to your training. <laughs> There's a number of you here. A long time ago. <laughs> Uh, I have a question uh, about Webmaster Tools, Google's Webmaster Tools. Um, I uh, invest in websites and purposely did a play on some thin content sites, bought five sites, uh, mainly for experimentation, but there's, there was real money involved in the transaction. Four of the sites were hooked up to Webmaster Tools. One site never had ever been hooked up to Webmaster Tools. On December 8th, right around... Christmas time when lots of retail oriented sites are making money. Uh, four of the sites got penalized. Uh, two got penalized for uh, bad linking and two got penalized for thin content. Uh, I've since gotten two of those penalties removed and two I never did. I just had to give up. But the fifth site is the one that really struck me because I did not receive a penalty. The traffic today equals the traffic from last year. And so I started to feel like, well, in all these years of thinking I should be hooked up to Google Webmaster Tools and thinking it's so helpful to me, is this one of the ways that they're gathering more insight into what I'm doing so that they can roll out those penalties efficiently on December 8th and hit multiple sites that are not connected? And I just wondered if you'd seen anything like that or if you think that there's uh, a play there. I personally think that there is just because I've been around this for a long time and it just seems to me that they're using it, whether they want to admit it or not, as a way of following what you're doing. And when they want to say, hey, we need to roll out, we're getting a lot of thin content sites, that's one way that they can grab a bunch of data at once and say, hit these guys. Uh, but yeah. I just wonder what you guys thought about it. Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. So if you're doing anything at all sketchy, don't, uh, don't claim your site on <laughs> Google Search Console. You know, that's, that's not enough though, right? Yeah, I but mean, you shouldn't be doing it, stuff that's... Yeah. Uh, that, Anything that you would be embarrassed to tell a Google engineer that you're doing, don't do it. Just don't do it. Because you need to be in Google Search Console, formerly known as Google Webmaster Tools. You need that data. You need that insight if something is going haywire with uh, crawling activity or whatever, or um, you do have a manual uh, action. That's the only way you're going to know. You have to be in, in Search Console. So... I, I get that that worked for you to not submit your site to Search Console. The problem is, is that's not a sustainable future uh, to uh, just avoid that. It's a signal for sure. They're paying attention to that. They're using it against you. 
and that's just the way it is. If you're in the search results, Google knows who you are. Uh, they're an ICANN member. They know you registered your domain. Uh, if you have a link to you, they know who you are. Uh, I think all of those uh, are probably bigger signals, but uh, it's sort of scary to think that that might actually uh, be the case. I, uh, I wouldn't think so it would be. You, they're uh, connecting up all your sites. They know your network because you've submitted the, these sites. Yeah. And there may be correlation, as you just mentioned, um, and it'd be worth some research. There was a question over I, here. I have a slightly different view on this. You do? Oh, I do. All right. I launched Bing Webmaster Tools in 2012, and so I have pretty good insight into how Webmaster Tools works at Google and at Bing. And those tools are not the collectors of any data. They are an aggregator of data from services within the search engine. They are a dashboard that shows you what several other services inside the search engine know about you and that have deemed acceptable to share publicly, or at least with you in a public field. So Bing Webmaster Tools in and of itself is not an, a node that reports anything. Now, the JavaScript that is used for Google Analytics or uh, Search Console that is an entirely different animal. And that little piece of JavaScript, every single time there is a change on any page, anywhere those things exist, they report back to the head office. Something has changed, come fetch me. Anyone using Chrome? Yeah, so Chrome is basically a crawler for Google. So there are an incalculable number of instances where brand new websites that have no links pointed at them, absolutely nothing at all, are instantly indexed because the person who put them live is using Chrome. And as soon as they visit the website, there it is. Google already knows this. They are a domain name registrar. So as soon as your DNS changes, they know instantly. They pre-ready the crawler at the domain waiting to see what happens. So if your one in five hasn't been hit, that's largely luck because it hasn't popped on a radar for one of those internal systems yet. So no one of the things that's happening with it has reached a threshold that the system has then queried itself internally to take a look at that snapshot and say, ah, I should probably add you to this list. That may be a matter of time, um, but like bell bottoms, I'm guessing if you wait a while, some of those things will come back into fashion and the threshold lowers for you so you're safer. Okay, question over here. Yeah, um, is the optimum frequency of pruning specified in the step-by-step -step -step process? There isn't really an optimal. Uh, everybody understands the definition of loop, right? You look it up in the dictionary, it says C loop. <laughs> that was a joke. I'll wait Another for that. Joke, yeah. I'll, I'll, that you know, a... come on, you can do it. Um, so <laughs> fundamentally, when you're done with the process, you start, you start again. again. Who's okay. responsible for maintaining your inbound link profile? The people linking to you or you? You. Who cares? Yep. So bad links happen all the time. Um, so I've not run a link building program on my site. I have somewhere north of a million inbound links. That's a lot. So I decided to run link pruning on my own site. We went looking and if we found out that my site, which is historically very well ranked, actually ranked. And what happened was people were going out and writing scrapers that would issue a query to Google, grab the search result page, insert their link at the top, and then republish it on a XYZ domain or somewhere else, right? I had almost 100,000 of those pages that had never had anything to do with my site, ever, out there. Out of my million, 10% were pure trash scraper pages. I had nothing I could do with it. I was just stuck with it. So um, yeah, link pruning, you don't know when those things are gonna happen. You don't know where they're gonna come from. Uh, it's just that when you're done, you should start over. Okay. So here's, here's my suggestion on this, right? Um, in any given business, everybody has a job to do. Often they have many jobs to do. So when you're looking at this, uh, your first pass, you should be very concerned about what that scenario looks like. You're setting a kind of baseline for yourself. Um, after that, 
get an idea of how much time it took you to go through that process and to kind of filter out some of this crap, understand that with muscle memory, this will become a faster process for you, assign it as a job task to someone on a recurring basis and monitor it. You may find that you can do this once a month and it's just a, a task that takes three hours and it's once a month and there you are. You may find that in the first six months of this, you're doing it a lot more frequently to get on top of it. And along the way, you might uncover some things that are extremely important to your business that you were unaware of. Like uh, for one of the clients that I'm struggling with right now, this XYZ stuff is on autopilot somewhere. And the owners that we've been able to track so far are in Brazil and Panama and several other places where you can't just phone someone and say, could you please stop? It, what it will do is help you understand then if you're actually in a chess game and what's going on. Because you can do everything else, but if you're unaware, it, there could be massive erosion happening and that's why you're not having success in other areas, which then means this whole link pruning thing becomes a much more important endeavor for your website. And you may have to put two people on it at a higher frequency. Do you think it's possible to develop a program that would automatically link prune all the time? Possible, yes. Um, advisable? Mm, you need some human yeah. insight into this, right? Okay. Yeah. So, Just so run uh, like a link detox or something on a periodic basis, like yeah. every quarter or every month even? A okay. big part is whether the inbound link is organic. See, it might be a high-quality site, but it may have nothing to do with your business, mm -hmm. in which case it may not help you at all. By the way, that's one of the problems with disavow. Uh, just so everybody understands, disavow is logically you telling Google that you're no following a link from the receiving end of the link. You're saying, I, I don't want anything to do with this inbound link. The problem is, your link to me might be totally inorganic, but your link to Dwayne might be totally appropriate. Yeah. So if I disavow you because you're inorganic to me, it doesn't mean you're a bad link to everybody. Okay. So th there's some confusion yeah. in the eyes of the search engine, so they have to deal with them on a one-by-one -one basis. Yeah, so we, that's the way that works. We'd actually ask Google about that, and we said, hey, you know, we want to solve this problem, and can we just wildcard dot domain and deal with it? And they were like, oh, my God, no, don't do that. Please, no. That creates confusion. That can be a problem. And so we were like, all right. That's fine. It makes sense. And I know from Bing, we had the exact same answer because the problem is you throw the baby out with the bathwater. And when you do that, because these systems, it's, it's handy to think in terms of what Google tells us, rank brain, AI, ooh, this must be really smart, okay? Um, essentially, they've given the keys to the Cadillac to a three-year-old. I'm not sure exactly how smart that is out of the gate. You know, we're going to lose some fences. We're going to lose some mailboxes. The neighborhood will come back. The lawn will regrow. But there could be some casualties along the way. And ultimately, the challenge when it comes to these things is the more discrete the input is, the easier it is for their systems to be able to understand it. When you start grouping it together, we all get the concept of wildcard.domain. That's not a problem. But if you just hand that to the algorithm, the algorithm sees it in black and white. It doesn't understand the nuances. So it will not go through and say, oh, yeah, no, I understand what you meant was get rid of all of the bad from that domain, but then keep the good ones. It, it simply executes on it, and, and that's, that's the end for everything in that. And so the advice, obviously, is you know, stay away from those kind of wild card scenarios. Um, Google will tell you they're really good at filtering, you know, like .us links and .whatever domain is popular today. And yeah, they are to a level. But then after that, it kind of fizzles out a bit. Well, another thing, too, is don't be too aggressive with your disavowing because you could yeah. tank your rankings by disavowing yep. too much. And good you know, links that benefited you now get thrown out with the bathwater. This is interesting. How many links does it take to rank a page at the top of the stack? Does anyone know? Got a number for me? Way after coffee. Come on, people, play the game. Zero. Zero, okay. We have an opening bit of zero links. Anyone else? <laughs> Five, what is this? The Price is Right? show. <laughs> 5,260. 5,260, okay, the answer is uh, much closer to zero and one. Um, you often only need two or three links pointed at you to rank well, so to Stefan's point, uh, you have to be careful, Missy, the queen of one or two links, you know? 
Um, the, you have to be careful with the, what you're disavowing because you may look at a domain and go, uh, greasy, don't like that. And then just disavow the domain and go through and just put everything in your list because you didn't do the research to find out that they actually have a legitimate blog post happening. I, I'm not going to say this is greasy, but entrepreneur, business insider, all of these places, right? Great places for exposure. Yeah, okay. The links that are in all of those articles from the guest authors are well known and ignored by the engines. There's no value to those. They know somehow there's been an exchange that has enabled that link to exist. So they just ignore the whole thing. So that's an example of the kind of polite end of that spectrum, yeah, right? Like 90 people to follow on Twitter and XYZ industry. Yeah. So those sorts of things that you see yeah. on, on those sites. Exactly. And so, um, so you do have to be very careful with this because what's actually providing you value is providing tangible value. So if you jettison those, you, you're really doing yourself a disservice. If, however, you take the time to figure it out and you keep the legitimate ones and get rid of the rest of them, that is a clear signal to the search engine that you are paying attention, that you are taking this seriously. And that comes back to your reputation, which can and often makes the difference between you in, you're in a penalty or you're out of a penalty. You're included in an update or you're excluded from an update. It can often comes down to that. I think that overall, everybody for years has been captive to the whoever dies with the most links wins approach. Mm -hmm. And it's really a quality versus a quantity game. Uh, I, if, how many, if I were a real estate agent and all my competition had 100 links, how many do I need? And the answer is the 10 right links is all it takes. Mm -hmm. So uh, a good quality link is definitely better than a quantity at any one time. And uh, quantity just gives you that much more opportunity to be in a bad neighborhood. So I think it's you, you prune to the best and, and get rid of the rest. And you have to differentiate, too, between a deep link and a link to your homepage because all of the link authority tends to flow to your homepage and then you pass that around with your internal linking structure. Mm -hmm. But if you get a deep link to, let's say, a product page, just mm -hmm. one could make all the difference in your rankings. So you, you wanna work to get more deep links to product pages, category pages, individual articles and things that you want to rank, not just rely solely on your homepage links coming in. Okay, so I'm interested in switching. How many people are interested in the topic of thin content, duplicate content, things like that? Anybody? So no few? one. <laughs> They're all in the back. Have you noticed yeah, that? Yeah, no, I see that, yeah. They're all clustered around the gigantic lights. Yeah. Um, why don't we just comment quickly on thin content, quality. Okay. And duplicate content? And duplicate content. All right, I'll start with duplicate content. So... Uh, duplicate content is not a penalty, it's a filter. A lot of people feel like it's a penalty because they are losing rankings or their competitor is, is choosing, uh, being chosen by Google instead of them. Uh, it's a query time filter. So at the time of the, the user makes the query that is determined which mm -hmm. are duplicates and which are, uh, are not. Duplicate content can happen within your site. It can happen across multiple sites. So scraper sites, or whatever, could be considered uh, duplicate content and get uh, filtered out. And that's what happens. Hopefully, you're not the one getting filtered out. It's unlikely if uh, we're talking about scraper sites. Google's really good at figuring out that those are scrapers and not letting them win. And uh, this, the idea behind this is Google wants diversity in the search results. They don't want to show results that look very similar to other results on the page, so they want uh, diversity. So the way that you would clean it up on your own site is with canonical tags, and there's a lot to go over, which we don't have time for, but if you have more uh, questions about it, come up afterwards, I'll, I'll happily go into excruciating detail about how to clean up duplicate content. But if you have uh, an XML sitemap, which you should, that's also a canonicalization signal. So only have canonical URLs in there, only URLs that are considered to be the definitive source URLs and not 
duplicates. So don't include things that have different sort orders and different tracking parameters. None of those should appear in your XML sitemaps. If you have URLs like that, uh, canonicalize, have a link, uh, rel canonical, pointing back to, to the canonical URL without the tracking parameters, without uh, the uh, affiliate IDs and all that sort of stuff. And um, if you have duplicate content, if you may have duplicate content across other sites that you don't know about, use this tool called Copyscape to check. It's a free tool. Just Google it, Copyscape, and uh, put in your URL and it'll check. Put in a URL of a product page, et cetera. You can also go onto Google and put uh, in quotes a phrase from one of your product pages or whatever and check to see what comes up. So we have to wrap up fairly quickly, folks. I'm, I'm going to say this, okay? Duplicate content, if it's a problem for you, identify it, fix it. It is hurting you. There is no clear percentage of what duplication is. So you can't look for something and say, oh, if it's 50% the same, it's considered duplicate. No, you have to be thorough, which leads to the next one, thin content. Do you want a doctor who came from community college or do you want a doctor who came from John Hopkins? You want an authority, you want an expert. You have to be that, and you don't do that through thin content. That's the bottom line with thin content, don't do it. Does anybody remember Demand Media? Company that went public on thin content and then spectacularly imploded when Google filtered out thin content. That is an object lesson to everybody of how thin doesn't work. That was the Panda algorithm, yeah. by the way. Yeah, one business responsible for that. So, so these types of things are very, very real. Yes, content is expensive to build and maintain, and it is an expense that every business has to invest in properly. So there's no shortcuts there. And I'll, I will just comment, we will be here to answer questions, so I'm sure some of you have more. Uh, we've tried to be broad, and uh, for each question, we tried to answer more than the question to give you more information, a little bit broader than that. But we'll be around. If you want to rush the stage, uh, just don't hurt yourselves. But yeah. we'll be around. <laughs> yeah, and everybody who asked a question can get a book. Uh, so come on up afterwards. And if I have some books left, uh, people who have really good questions, uh, and come up and ask uh, at the end here. Uh, once the sen session finishes, I'll, I'll give you a book too. All right, let's. Oh, am I on? <laughs> let's give yeah. our panelists a round of applause, please. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for being here.